Sans plus liquide, plus vieux, plus potumé, mécho, plus j'ai tombé, chinisa, gakashita. invite the children of the Central Tibetan Schools Administration to present a bouquet to each of our guests. We now invite uh, Mr. Apurva Chandra, Chairman of the Central Tibetan Schools Administration, to make a formal welcome. A quick introduction that he's a civil engineer by training with a postgraduate degree from IIT Delhi. And uh, at the HRD, uh, amongst the many responsibilities, are looking at the operation of the Central Schools and the Nav uh, Navodhya Schools, uh, as well as the examination systems, open schoolings, and a whole range of responsibilities. Namaskar. Tashi Dilik, and good afternoon. <clears throat> it's a mat matter of great privilege for us in the Central Tibetan Schools Administration to have with us His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to bless this gathering and our organization. His Holiness is not only the spiritual and temporal head of Tibetans, but also an apostle of peace and harmony, 
who has enriched this world with his teachings and thoughts. CTSA came into existence in 1960 through a dialogue between His Holiness and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who visualized the need for modern education in Tibetan children in India. In fact, His Holiness's predecessor, the 13th Dalai Lama, when he visited different countries in the world, he realized the necessity of modern education. And that time in 1915, he took the step of sending Tibetan children to England and other countries to learn modern technologies. His Holiness Dalai Lama, when he came to India in 1959, realized, like Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, that schools will be the modern temples. And he laid more emphasis on setting up schools than on monasteries. And we, the CTSA, as well as the Tibetan children, owe their learning and their grounding in this modern world to his foresight. We welcome you, sir. <laughs> I also welcome Shri Kapil Sibal, Honorable Minister for Human Resources Development, Communications and Information Technology. The Honorable Minister is a leading luminary of the country, but he would be now be remembered more for ushering changes in the education scenario of the country, which are necessitated by the need to harness the demographic dividend <clears throat> from India's young population. The implementation of the Right to Education Act, the uh, continuous and comprehensive evaluation scheme, the new mission and emphasis on teachers' education and training and now the recently launched National Vocational Education Qualification Framework are transformational in nature, which will be a rich dividend for the country for several years. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of this gathering. <laughs> we are also fortunate to have with us Mr. Lobsang Sange, the Kalantripa of Central Tibetan Administration. His leadership has provided a young face for the Tibetan community and signifies the rise of youth power. <clears throat> we are also proud to showcase him as a product of our schools. He graduated from the Central Tibetan School, Darjali. And thereafter, he went to Delhi University, obtained his degree in law and English, and went to Harvard University to pursue a career, uh, his post-graduation and doctorate <clears throat> in law. He has returned to work for the upliftment of his community, leaving his family and career at Harvard. I have personally shared a lot of experiences with him, including a long track over the hills in Tarapshala. <clears throat> I welcome you, sir. <clears throat> we are also fortunate to have with us Mrs. Anshu Vesh, Secretary, Department of School Education, and Shri Ashok Thakur, Secretary, Department of Higher Education, who with their tireless efforts are, <clears throat> are implementing the vision and the education policies of the government at the ground level so as to achieve the vision of education for all. I welcome you. <clears throat> I also welcome all the officers of Government of India and other educational institutions, representatives of CTA Dharamshala, ex-employees, the alumni who I see in a large number, and the guests present at this occasion. We also welcome the ex-directors, education officers, principals, rectors, teachers, who have made CTSA what it is over the past 50 years. <laughs> the CTSA made a small beginning in 1950 with 50 students when the first CTSA school, 1960, sorry, when the first CTSA school was established at Masuri. There, thereafter, the school at Shimla, Darjeeling, Dalhousie, and others followed. The student strength has increased from 50 in 1960 to 8,760 now in 2012. There are 783 teaching and non-teaching employees on the rolls of CTSA. 
A large number of alumni have passed out from these schools and are doing us proud in society. <clears throat> the CTSA was established as a separate entity so that it can provide modern education to Tibetan children living in India while preserving and promoting the language and rich cultural heritage. The CTSA schools are affiliated to CBSE and equipped with all modern educational tools like computers, video conferencing equipment, resource centers, etc. The schools also have spiritual teachers and Tibetan music and dance teachers to impart Tibetan culture and folk dance and songs to the children. Co-curricular activities form an important part of these schools. The traditional uh, uh, classroom teaching has been replaced by activity-based learning. These schools, uh, which if you witness the exhibition outside, were not in a very good state till the 80s and 90s. But since 2000, the government of India has made available plan funding for the CTSA. And thereafter, as you can witness in the exhibition, the quality of school buildings has improved considerably. During a function to celebrate the Golden Jubilee of CTSA, Darjeeling, the Kalan Tripa raised, was remembering the quality of food served in the school when he was at school. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the quality of food had not improved much. But over the past three, four months, we have taken a decision and we have doubled the mess allowance in all the CTSs, more than double this mess allowance, and uh, we hope that the quality of food would improve, it would have improved in the schools by now. The suggestion of CT administration for increasing the border seats and intake of Indian students from border areas has also been accepted by the government. While we celebrate 50 years of CTSA, we must also work hard in, re in rejuvenating this institution as the number of students in CTSA schools has been showing a declining trend over the last 20 years. The peak of about 10,500 students was achieved in 1990, and now it is about 8,750. This may be due to improved availability of educational facilities outside the CTSA system, or the integration of Tibetan population with the Indian population over the years. I would end with the quotation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. When educating the minds of our youth, we must not forget to educate their hearts. I hope that CTSA has succeeded in both over the past 50 years. Thank you. My job is to thank CTSA in general. But I would like to begin with uh, Your Holiness, our most revered leader, uh, as per your vision, your guidance, uh, we have established the Tibetan community in exile, comparatively one of the most successful ones. And as for your vision, uh, in discussion with then Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, we have established Central Tibetan Schools Administration, which has helped produce thousands of Tibetan students and professionals around the world. I would like to uh, acknowledge Honorable Kapil Sibilji, uh, honored to have met you a few weeks ago, and honored to acknowledge as Harvard Law School alum as well. And under your leadership, as uh, Apurva Chandraji mentioned, a lot of innovation uh, has been uh, initiated, which will have a very productive uh, impact uh, for the education system uh, in India. And uh, as per your vision, uh, the Indian uh, institutes will be one of the most esteemed and successful ones and recognized by uh, countries around the world. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Ashok Thakurji and uh, Anshul Bhayanshi uh, for being here, for lending your uh, kind support uh, to uh, the CTSA's program today. And under your leadership, you have been uh, very successful as well. And I would like to acknowledge by saying my friend, Apurpa Chandraji, Joint Secretary, as well as the Chairman of uh, uh, CTSA, uh, with whom, of course, we track the mountains of uh, Dharamsala and looking forward to trekking the mountains of Tibet one day. And I know you walk uh, uh, five kilometers a day, and given your fitness, I'm sure you can walk 
and hopefully I can catch up with you in days and years to come. And uh, under your leadership, yes, uh, CTSA has made giant leaps forward. Uh, as you heard me, not complaining about it, yes, the food condition we had in school, uh, that uh, normally we say uh, during our school days, we just get dal and bath uh, every day for dinner for 10 years that I had uh, eaten. It was not a complaint, but I was trying to showcase that despite the condition generously provided by the Indian government, we remain eternally grateful, and whatever we got, we took it respect and appreciation to the government of India and people of India. And with that kind of condition, we worked very hard and made our uh, ways to uh, Delhi University, myself, and to Harvard Law School, where I spent the last 16 years, and uh, open the election uh, last year. I felt it's a great privilege and honor to return to India to serve His Holiness Dalai Lama and uh, Tibetan people. So uh, we take great pride wherever we go. That we say that uh, under the Ministry of Human Resources, uh, despite the conditions of our schools, despite the food, uh, we remain uh, eternally uh, grateful and appreciative, and it's the hard work that counts. Uh, in that sense, we always mention that we are extremely grateful to the government and people of India. But after taking over uh, the political leadership, I feel more than ever more grateful, more heartfelt appreciation to the great country of India and to great uh, people of India because of people like you, the Honorable Minister, the Secretaries, the Joint Secretary, and Alok Brahmaji, because of your generosity, because of your kindness that you took Tibetans under your wings and provided all you can in the settlements and the schools. Uh, in that sense, you know, my job is to thank you, uh, CTSA's job. Uh, in one sense, it's easy because I just have to say thank you. On the other hand, it's very difficult because we cannot thank enough the government and people of India. Especially, I want to thank the staff members of CTSA. Uh, I can see many of them sitting here. And all the principals and headmasters and teachers. Uh, because I myself uh, got my education in CST Sunada, then uh, Darjeeling. I still remember my Sar Prasad. Uh, who taught me geography, and Sir Gupta, who taught me Hindi. Sometimes I can get by when I go to Hindi belt of India to get by giving speech in Hindi for 10, 15 minutes, then I have to stop and resume in English. Um, because uh, the teachers, uh, Indian teachers, staff members, they worked so hard. They took us and treated us like their ch own children. And because of their hard work, because of their commitment, because of the dedication, now we, uh, Tibetan community, are relatively successful uh, in the international forum as a cause. Thanks to his solemnist leadership, but people as a whole, we have stepped up, we have taken over the leadership, mainly because of the education we have gotten. And that is because of CTSA. The people like Alok Varmaji and Aparvaji and all other uh, secretaries and directors who have worked, and all other staff members of CTSA. We remain extremely uh, uh, grateful, and I'm happy to inform you that the Speaker of the Tibetan Parliament was also educated in Central Tibetan School. The Chief Judge, we can call him, was also educated in Tibetan School. In that sense, the present leadership of the Tibetan movement is educated uh, under CTSA. Now, uh, we always say Tibetan culture is precious and we have to preserve, protect it, and of course, we want to return to homeland Tibet. But then when you talk about Tibetan culture, as His Holiness always says, India is our guru, we are uh, India's Jela, because the Buddhism we have is from India. And also the nonviolence, ahimsa, uh, is the principle we follow in our cause, is also very much uh, in the principle uh, uh, advocated by Bapuji, uh, Mahatma Gandhiji. Uh, and then the democracy now, uh, the Tibetan administration had, we have borrowed from the pages of Indian constitution and Indian democracy. In that sense, actually, Tibetan cause is uh, made in India, and the Tibetan leaders are also uh, made in India. In that sense, the success of the Tibetan cause is the success of India. And if we fail, it might be really together. <laughs> so with all the education we have gotten, and the kindness and the love the CTSA teachers, staff members, all have shown to us, we, it, it has made imprints in our life, and we will move forward in this life, the education that we have gotten, the, the two fields that we are standing are of India and Indian people. So,
extremely, extremely, extremely grateful to the great country of India and people of India. And thank you, CTSA. And I'm proud to say all the students, Tibetan students who graduated from CTSA will feel the same when we say Jai Bharat, Jai Tibet. Thank you. May I invite Mr. Sibyl uh, with a few lines of his own poem that uh, resonates with us. I seek to turn the tide, to swim across the other side. Empower me in your domain. Equations won't then be the same. Revered His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Honorable Kalon Tripa, Central Tibetan Administration, Dr. Lobsang Sangaiji, Srimati Anshu Vesh, Secretary, School Education and Literacy, Sri Apurv Chandra, Joint Secretary and Chairman of the Central Tibetan Schools Administration, Distinguished guests and dignitaries, teachers, administrative officials of CTSA. Above all, students, media persons, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a proud moment for me to be in your midst today on the joyous occasion of the Golden Jubilee celebrations of one of the unique educational institutions in post-independent India, the Central Tibetan Schools Administration. CTSA in short. The CTSA is an institution born out of the vision of two great visionaries of all times, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. CTSA is a unique institution in the sense that it is not only transnational in character, but that it is engaged in the preservation and development of Tibetan history and culture. Your Holiness, your presence here today gives us inspiration and hope for the future. A future filled with peace and compassion. Thank you very much. The success story of the Central Schools of Tibet for Tibetans is also the success story of our educational policy planning and its implementation. The Central Schools for Tibetan, Tibetans have made a visible impact in every sense of the word. One recalls nostalgically when the CTSA was launched 50 years ago. It had the strength of only 50 students. Today, as the CTSA officials inform me, the strength is around 9,000 students enrolled in nine senior secondary schools, five secondary schools, and seven each of the middle primary schools. The academic performance is revealing with nearly 100% success in class 10 and 90% success in class 12. This academic success also reflects the advancement of young Tibetans who have taken to formal education with zeal. And the alumni of CTSA have created a niche for themselves in all spheres of life. I must compliment the CTSA for effectively utilizing its resources to develop a viable infrastructure and human resource base. We applaud the contributions of each one of you involved in this great venture. While we bask in the glory of the past when we celebrate the 50 years of existence of this institution, it is also the time and opportunity for us to look inwards and introspect to analyze where and what we could have done better and how we could have overcome the obstacles on our way to progress. So friends, let us see how the world has changed in the last 50 years. The world today is profoundly different from that 50 years ago. Today we are a global village owing to instantaneous communications, ease of travel and the revolution in information technology. These technological developments have fundamentally transformed the workplace, be it in science, technology, business, government, politics, and I dare say also education. 
We are witness to technological change that is absolutely mind-boggling. The rates at which things are changing now are much faster than ever before. Just look at the cell phone. Your smart cell phone today has more computing power than even the Apollo space capsule five years or five years with it. We now live in an age of knowledge. Knowledge is now doubling every five to seven years and the rate of change will accelerate in times to come. This self-propelling pro pro propelling technological pro pro uh, progress, unlike even 50 years ago, is altering the essential daily tools we need in our work life. Also, not everyone learns most effectively in the same way. And yet, in the face of all this evidence, we've hitherto relied mostly, perhaps entirely, on passive learning. Students listen to lectures or read um, on their own, and then get evaluated on the basis of their ability to demonstrate their mastery over content. They weren't asked to actively use the knowledge they had acquired. But this is now changing. <coughs> As we push forward with the digital transformation of education, it's worth taking a look at just how greatly technology can impact teaching and learning. And what's at stake? Not just for our students, but our society as a whole. Thus, we need to be predicting the impact of technology on work, life, and hence education needs over longer stretches of time. For as Douglas Adams once observed, the best way to predict the future is to build it. And this is exactly what we together should be doing. So let us attempt to peer into the future to ascertain what skills will be important 10 to 20 years from now, when today's toddlers, the millennials, will enter the education arena and the workforce. <laughs> education, we all recognize, will then be more about how to process and use information and less about imparting it. This is a consequence of both the proliferation of knowledge and how much of it any student can truly absorb and changes in technology. New technologies will profoundly alter the way knowledge is conveyed. Electronic readers will allow textbooks to be constantly revised and to incorporate audio and visual content. Think of a music text in which you can hear pieces of music as you read, or a history text in which you can see film clips about what you are reading. But there are even more profound changes in the offering. In our time, teachers had to prepare materials for their lectures and for their classes. Then it became clear that it would be a better, better system if textbooks were written by just a few of the most able experts. This will free teachers from preparing the lectures as they will have inbuilt stepwise electronic audiovisual lecture materials. Similarly, it makes sense for students to watch video of the clearest science teacher or biology students to touch, spin, and explore the structure of a molecule while they watch the Haldron experiment as students read about the Higgs boson or the most lucid analyst of Tibetan history and culture. This will enable teachers to spend less class time reviewing the basics and more time exploring advanced concepts and promoting critical thinking by leading thought provoking discussions with students, not to mention the material will be much better presented. There's also a collateral benefit to engagement with students who are more deeply engaged in what they are learning, leading to better performance. Also, technology will help students to satiate their thirst for connections between what they are learning in the classroom and how, and what they see happening in the real world. Thus, technology is accomplishing the very real task of connecting the learners more closely to their coursework, to their teachers, and to their classmates, and completes their homework assignments all in a digital environment. Bringing technology into the classroom will help them to draw these parallels and keep them interested in what they are learning. It also would provide options for students with different learning styles. Active 
learning classrooms which cluster students at furniture that can be arranged and rearranged and integrated with technology. That will enable teachers to interact more meaningfully with their students through the collection and analysis of performance data, making the classroom truly smarter. This will enable teachers to assess where the students are strong and where they are weak, how they learn best, and use this data to create personalized pathways to help students build their knowledge and skills. These systems will use student assessments to gather performance data and point students to course content that's specifically targeted to help them build their knowledge and skills. Such formative assessment programs will help provide insights directly to teachers, allowing them to more efficiently personalize their instruction for every student in the classroom. Education will thus need to keep abreast of the new knowledge and technology that is being created and the ability to be a lifelong learner. This factor is driving curriculum changes and that requires students to acquire multi and transdisciplinary skill sets. The general perception amongst most parents about the quality of present day school education is that while the content may have enlarged, the quality of education has declined. My own view is that it is their concept of education that has remained static. The level of competition today is not local, but global. I thus feel that in the years to come, schools generally, and CTSA schools more particularly, should not only be institutions of learning, but must also provide an individualized environment where a student learns the simple techniques of goal setting, planning, dealing with difficult situations in life. In short, life skills must become a central focus of educational efforts. Thus, in the present day context, it is not enough for teachers to merely give information and knowledge to students. This is, of course, basic, but more than information and knowledge, human beings need wisdom. And you have here in the Dalai Lama, His Excellency, the epitome of wisdom. They need character. You have in the Dalai Lama, a person who epitomizes character. Hence, our emphasis is not only on expansion of and providing access to the educational system of all those who seek to study, but more importantly also on improving the knowledge base and quality of our teachers. Let us not forget that good teachers are costly, but bad teachers cost the nation much more. CTSA schools should thus strive to provide a challenging and enabling environment for children in and outside the classroom. I have to say that I have a personal affinity towards young Tibetans because a large number of them live in my constituency and I interact with them uh, ever so often. And I quite understand the troubles and tribulations that they have to be confronted with in their life ahead. And I can only say this, that as long as they follow compassion, tolerance, and that's what this nation is all about. India is the cultural cosmos of the world in the sense is it epitomizes what we call tolerance and compassion. This is a country which encompasses and embraces, embrace, embraces. It's a country that brings within its fold all the different hues of the world. It is a country which is central to humanity. It is the universality of India that is most important. And it is here that we embrace our Tibetan friends who are living here with us. CTSA's performance over the last 50 years has been commendable. But let us not bask in our past glory. We need to strive, work, and achieve even more that in time to come, CTSA institutions are envy and are admired for others to emulate. Jai Hind. A, a vision that makes one feel that uh, it would be wonderful to be young again and a student again. Uh, I may invite His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, to say more, hopefully, than a few words. Uh, he's often described 
um, in, you know, sort of the Tibetans as uh, gurus and the Indians as chelas. But I think surely there has been a reversal of that role. And I think we chelas uh, of His Holiness look towards our gurus' wisdom and insights. Respected uh, senior brothers and sisters, and of course, the brothers, sisters. Firstly, whenever I talk, I always consider I'm talking to another human being. In the fundamental level, we have no differences. We are same. In fact, seven billion human beings are same. Mentally, emotionally, physically. I usually emphasize this because it seems a lot of trouble, essentially, which we human beings created. These troubles not come on the view we are the same human being, but these troubles come on the basis of uh, too much sort of the divisions, on the basis of uh, little, little differences, nationality, religious belief, and races, and different systems, and within the same sort of follower of religious faith, or same nationality, but still, then different professions. Uh, within the same profession, there's the social background, right? And rich and poor or influential or uninfluential. We need too much emphasis on the secondary level of differences. So that will cause him unnecessary problem. So that problem will not solve just to repeat word peace, peace, peace. No. We have to think on a fundamental level we are the same human being, no differences. Everyone want happy life. Do not want suffering. Everyone have that right, same right. So some sort of genuine conviction. We are same. We have same right. Then, then instead of sort of actually fighting or quarrel and helping each other, all want happy life. And if your position is a little bit better compared or compared to it, then it is your responsibility to help them like that. So, uh, so that also I usually consider the basis of human value, whether believer or non-believer. Uh, I always talk the ultimate source of inner peace, happiness, is basic human value. Biologically, we equipped these values, not through religious teaching, not necessarily through education, but biologically, we already equipped. Now, education should be uh, strengthening these basic values. Sometimes existing modern education is to consider these secondary level of differences and really neglect about basic human values. So I consider I am <coughs> as a human being on that level, wherever I go, I always <coughs> talk about human value and try to promote that basic human value. 
That's the source of individual happiness, source of help, source of family happiness, source of a successful community, peaceful community, national level, finally global level. So if we really want peace, then we should not so think or God or Buddha and pray them no. Of course, no harm to pray to God, to pray to Buddha. <laughs> Please bring peace on this on this planet. <laughs> does, does that. No harm. But actually, peace must have developed within our mind, within our, our, our own mind. Then, now this is the uh, uh, sort of occasion for me personally, some special significance. Uh, the uh, 53, actually 51, or 50, I think 52, no. since 1960. Uh, so, anniversary. <coughs> so, this reminds me very clear. So, also the sort of, uh, vision, sorry, vision, pointed. Me, me don't want to. That appears to my mind. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's face uh, in office in his residence, Tin Mutin somewhere, Tin Mutin, without hat, so very shining. Because <laughs> 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 a hat, very nice person, very nice person, uh, and often you see make a joke. Uh, so, I reach India uh, as a political asylum, uh, April 1959. Uh, then, of course, we are very much concerned about rehabilitation, uh, about you see, several, uh, every, several, several thousand, I think around uh, 70,000, 80,000 refugees at that time. Uh, meantime, uh, we seriously thinking the, the establishment of education for today, uh, uh, school or education sort of facilities. Then Pandit Nehru, of course, he himself very much educated sort of person, highly educated person, and very experienced person. Uh, and the Tibetan case, he personally you see, showing sort of deep sort of interest, deep concern. I think I want to share this one story. 1954, I was in Peking, the Chinese sort of Congress, first Congress meeting. So I was one of the delegation, delegation member from Tibet. So at that time, uh, Pandit Nehru uh, came to Peking. So one day, an official dinner, you see, offered by Chinese Prime Minister, Zhou Enlai. Very smart. Of course, very smart, but the way his eyes looks also sometimes creates suspicion. <laughs> Too much clever, <laughs> if I like that. <laughs> so, uh, so, we all the guests at this particular day, uh, what, what do you call it, the dignitaries of the Chinese government site. Mm. I also there. And Benjamin, I'm also there. Uh, we're just waiting. Big line. Then, Pandit Nehru. No, yes. Zhu uh, Le, that way, way. And uh, Le and Pandit Nehru, yes, they came together. And Zhu Le introduced each sort of Hasidi person. Then, so they went to reach uh, 
me, yeah. The journalist introduced this dharala. Then Bandar Nehru actually becomes something like motionless. <laughs> no word, no movement. His man, I, I was looks to sit down. Realize that. <laughs> then that moment I felt, oh, but Nero. Of course, knows about Tibet. So I think that short moment, so a lot of sort of thoughts, I think reflect in his mind. So then, 56, 56, I had the opportunity, came to India, Buddha Jayanti celebration. Uh, so a lot of meeting with Bhattu Nero. And of course, all of the dignitaries. And at that time, many Gandhian freedom fighters, old freedom fighters. Also, I had the opportunity meeting. So then, uh, I had a lot of discussions with Pandit Nehru about Tibet, and he really gave me his suggestions, views. And sometimes he losing a little bit of his temper also, you see. <laughs> when I mentioned certain things, and, and he found a little contradictions, then he showed something <laughs> like that. We have very good sort of close sort of feeling. Then mainly, according to his advice, uh, 57, I returned. Uh, then 59, I said the things really become out of our control. There's no other choice except escape. Then I met, I think I reached, uh, I think third week, April in Mussoorie. Then within, I think, two, three days, went to Nehru, you see. Uh, of course, the other sort of business, uh, I think, naturally there. But meantime, he came to see me and a long talk. So I felt he personally involved something about Tibet. So then, um, six days or late 50s and 59s, and then early 60s, uh, some, besides some other sort of problems, also you see, discuss about education. Well, then one occasion, but then he told me, the best way uh, in order to keep Tibetan issue alive is to give proper education to younger Tibetan people. Then also, uh, when you see within our own sort of people, you see the different opinion. Some say, oh, medium, medium of instruction should be Hindi. Some say should be English. Then I seek advice by the Nero. And he says, oh, English is international language, should be English. Uh, so he personally should be involved. Then finally, then I, I remember Shri Mali is a union education minister. Uh, uh, one, one occasion we say lunch, Pandit Nehru and Shri Mali also there. Then we say the, uh, Pandit Nehru used to ask Shri Mali, now after lunch, you see, Kasura should announce the setting of this sort of CDF. Right. Oh. Yes. Oh, this is this sort of organization, uh, this institution, and at that time, Shirmali himself as a chairman, I think chair. So then, all of these schools, step by step, established. Now, after 52, 52 years, Most of our sort of people who are sort of carrying, or <coughs> say, the responsibility 
in various fields. All like Rosa Sange and our speaker and others. All at that time. Some not yet born. <laughs> Did you write you right? Oh, he is not yet born. <laughs> maybe some other planet, maybe <laughs> previous previous reincarnation. Or inside Tibet. <laughs> fought with. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so that at the time of death, maybe he determined born in India and carry continuously some struggle. Maybe. <laughs> Possible, isn't it? <laughs> in any way. So now that generation. Uh, now take full responsibility in various fields. So that's why I develop full confidence. Now time come, I should retire. And not only myself retired, but nearly four century old Tibetan tradition, the Ranam institution uh, automatically, you see, carry the responsibility, because our temporal as well as spirituality. So that now ended, not due to certain pressure, but voluntarily, happily, proudly ended. Because, as I mentioned earlier, I had full, full sort of confidence. Now our younger generation, who educated this country, they can carry all responsibility. Uh, now regarding modern education, and uh, regarding, I think, education, I think 7th centuries, 8th centuries, 9th uh, centuries, and, and then continuously, I think, several centuries. Sometimes Tibetan emperor, emperor Rwa, invite Indian sort of scholars, a significant sort of scholar, Shanda uh, Rikshita, 8th century. One of the top master philosopher, Madhimika philosopher, as well as great logician. He invited by Tibetan emperor, 8th century. He was the original uh, our guru, Indian guru. Then continuously, number of Indian scholars, Indian saints, came to Tibet and teach us. And also young Tibetan went to India, study first language. I think first, not only language, but climate, because of climatized, sorry. Oh, no. So Tibetan very much afraid Indian heat, <laughs> already at that time also. <laughs> so they reach in some sort of area, then gradually, you see, come to plain, like that through a lot of hardship, but through that way. One Tibetan scholar, he mentioned, I often used to mention him, uh, he mentioned Tibet, land of snow. So nature color of snow is white, bright. But he mentioned, till light come from India, that land of snow, still dark. Only light come from India reached Tibet. Then it become bright. It is true, very true. Although we already have it's a close link with Chinese emperor. Even marriage there. Uh, since 7th century. But as far as knowledge is concerned, particularly Buddhist sort of knowledge, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist concept is concerned, Buddhist logic is concerned, they said the Tibetan emperor prefer re bring directly from India. So, as that Tibetan scholar mentioned, you see, India 
ancient time, India truly give us wisdom. So myself, uh, quite often you say, I describe myself as a son of India. On one occasion, some overseas Chinese reporters just came to see me. And then one, one reporter used to ask me, why you mentioned you yourself as a son of India? I think he felt that this is a political sort of reason. Then I told him uh, the truth. Look, my brain, every particle of my brain uh, filled by Indian thought. That means since my, you see, uh, my own education, six, seven years old, I already start learning. According to our tradition, you see, learning by heart, all those root texts. All these root texts wrote by Indian, Indian masters, mainly Nalanda masters, like Nagarjuna, uh, Aryadeva, uh, and Chandakirti, uh, like that. So all root texts wrote by Indian masters. So I learned, six, seven year old. But that time I had no interest, <laughs> no enthusiasm to learn, but compulsory because of my tutor, sometimes a little threat to me. <laughs> but eventually, everybody sort of, the brain, brain cells is filled by Indian thought, Nalan thought, that's Indian thought. That's about 50 years ago, uh, about three years ago. So I told, uh, then my physical, this physical, last 50 years, uh, survived by Indian dolls. No matter, it's a poor condition, <laughs> poor, 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 poor quality. But you see, this body survived by Indian dolls, Indian rice, Indian chapati. <laughs> so therefore, I consider myself as a son of India. <laughs> that seems to see, he, he understood that. So then, no further sort of argument. This is true. So, ancient time, I think the Tibetan wisdom, you taught us. So I always describe Indians as our guru. We are chela. Now in modern time, particularly with the Tibetan refugee community, now you also taught us modern education. So, we really, really grateful. Education standard in modern education system, modern education is concerned. Of course, inside Tibet, thousands, thousands of Tibetan is get education and also university level in China proper. Uh, but firstly, it's in their knowledge. I often is telling uh, my Chinese student friends in India, also in the West or some different countries, I always is telling them, oh, in your own country, uh, you cannot use both eyes, both ears, only one eye, one ear. Now in free country, you have the opportunity, so you must use both eyes, both ears. <laughs> I often is tell Chinese students, so similar to those Tibetan. Uh, one time, after Cultural Revolution, uh, one Tibetan who worked in some Chinese department, I think that, I think, uh, early 80, I think, early 80, I met, he doesn't know about the Gaza Revolution. So he live in, work, live in Lhasa, but doesn't know. So such sort of, sort of situation, tight control, censorship. Even persons of contact with their family, everybody fear, cannot tell truth, like that. So. So although the education inside Tibet also you see there, there are, uh, but compare education here in the Jewish community, I think 
us is better. So this, I think, we really feel proud. Right? So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all those concerned officials and teachers. Uh, and then also, we should pray with memory. Right? Please remember uh, those Indian teachers and also like Kaza, Kaza Sham Narayan Kaza, right? Sham Narayan Marve. I I think I think Sham Narayan. Huh? Huh? I remember him. So such people who really dedicated. Uh, for our children's education. So I remember. Still I remember. So we must pray for them. So they are, their contribution, I think, great. Uh, so I really want to thank you, and not only uh, on behalf of myself, but also I think I can thank to you, to all those concerned people, uh, on behalf of the Tibetan Jewish community, then indirectly on behalf of six million Tibetan people. I think I can, so I can, I can express my deep thanks. So, Indo-Tibetan relations is not only something century old, but very deep in spiritual field. Not just economic reasons or political reasons or some other reasons, but relation between Chela and Guru. So, so this relation in the future also will remain forever. Thank you. Thank you.